and welcome back for the final video in our 17th annual Jefferson County Historic Preservation Symposium. Since 2020 marks the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment, which guaranteed women's constitutional right to vote, we thought it would be a great time to present a talk on the women's suffrage movement in Colorado. Our next presentation is called Votes for Women, How Colorado Led the Way and is presented by JCHC member Bonnie Scudder. Bonnie is a fifth generation Coloradan. She has worked in public education throughout her career and, o and holds a doctorate and master's degree in education. Bonnie was a teacher and, administ and administrator at both Denver and Jefferson County Public Schools. And she has taught every grade since uh, the early grades all the way through graduate school. She is the author of a local history book called The Secrets of Elk Creek, Schaefer's Crossing, Staunton State Park, and beyond. Over to you, Bonnie. Hello, my name is Bonnie Scudder, and I'm a member of the Jefferson County Historical Commission. I'm happy to share my presentation entitled Votes for Women, How Colorado Led the Way. The cartoon on the right is a cartoon drawn by artist Henry Mayer in 1915. Entitled The Awakening, it shows Lady Liberty as she strides across the western part of the United States where women had obtained the right to vote, while the women from the east and the south reach out to her begging for her help. Suffrage is defined as the right to vote in public elections. American women were granted suffrage and voted for the first time in 1920. Some states, including Colorado, had granted suffrage to women earlier. The image on the right shows three suffragists who have been imprisoned for participating in a demonstration. In the early 1800s, women were prevented from voting, from owning land, earning wages, and they were forced to submit to laws without representation. They were also prevented from attending college and from participating in most church affairs. They were subjected to a different moral code than men. Women were made to feel dependent and expected to be submissive to men. The National Women's Rights Convention was held in Seneca Falls, New York in 1848. It was attended by about 300 men and women. The purpose was to discuss social, civil, and religious rights of women. The goal of the women's suffrage movement was to achieve a constitutional amendment guaranteeing women the right to vote. The Declaration of Sentiments, which we just saw, was proposed by Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott. Frederick Douglass argued in support, and it was signed by 68 women and 32 men. The image at the right shows the Seneca Falls Convention with the ladies and the gentlemen all very dressed up for this important event. Elizabeth Cady Stanton was born in New York. Her father was a lawyer. She attended the Troy Female Seminary as women were not allowed to enroll in college. She married Henry Stanton, a lawyer, in 1840, and they had seven children. She was an abolitionist, a human rights activist, and one of the first leaders of the women's rights movement. She also was president of the National Women's Suffrage Association for 20 years, working closely with Susan B. Anthony. The picture of Stanton on the right was taken around 1880. Susan B. Anthony was born in Massachusetts in 1820. Her father owned a cotton mill and the family was Quaker. She attended a Quaker school near Philadelphia and then an academy in New York. She was an abolitionist, writer, teacher, and lecturer and founded the National Women's Suffrage Association with Stanton in 1869. She voted illegally in 1872 in the presidential election and was fined $100 but never paid that fine. She published the history of women's suffrage in the 1880s and was honored a hundred years later with her image on our dollar coins. The image of Susan B. Anthony was taken around 1870. Sojourner Truth was an abolitionist and a women's rights activist. She was born into slavery 
in New York, and her parents had both come as slaves from West Africa. She escaped to freedom in 1826 and challenged a white man who had bought her son. Her son was returned to her. She changed her name to Sojourner Truth in 1843. She was very religious and became involved with abolitionists who also advocated for women's rights in Massachusetts. She spoke at the first National Women's Rights Conference and toured giving speeches about abolition. She spoke extemporaneously as she was unable to read or write. She was one of the foremost leaders of the abolition movement and an early advocate of women's rights. She also was a close friend of Susan B. Anthony and Lucretia Mott. Suffrage was a long struggle lasting many decades. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, and Lucy Stone addressed groups about suffrage, but they were not successful. After the Civil War, the American Equal Rights Association worked for suffrage for African Americans and women. The 14th and 15th Amendments were passed and ratified, stating that voting by citizens could not be denied based upon race, color, or previous condition of servitude. In 1869, women in Wyoming were given the right to vote. That was the Wyoming Territory. In 1872, Victoria Woodhull ran for the President of the United States. She was nominated by the Equal Rights Party. Challenges, demonstrations, and referendums regarding women's suffrage continued. Many states had referendums on women's suffrage, but they failed to pass. Women, however, were granted the right to vote in some school and municipal elections, and this was often called school suffrage. Some territories granted women, granted suffrage to women for a short time, but most of them removed it. The Suffrage Amendment of 1878, a federal amendment would grant women the right to vote was introduced for the first time by Senator Aaron A. Sargent of California. The amendment did not pass, but it was presented at every Congress after. Four decades later, it did pass as the 19th Amendment to the Constitution. The poster on the right was drawn by a suffragist and artist named Blanche Ames. It is entitled The Next Rung, and she illustrates the struggle that women had climbing the, the ladder to progress while fighting injustice and prejudice along the way. The Colorado Referendum of 1877. When Colorado became a state in 1876, equal suffrage was presented, but it did not pass. Women, however, were allowed to vote in school elections. In 1877, a referendum on full suffrage for women was held. National suffrage leaders, including Susan B. Anthony, joined local suffrage partisans to barnstorm the state. Former territorial governor John Evans supported this effort, but it was defeated by a two-to-one margin. Only 28 percent of the Jeffco voters approved. Suffragists vowed to step up the grassroots efforts to educate the public particularly women, on the benefits of female franchise. Extensive grassroots efforts took place in every cal county in Colorado. Carrie Chapman Catt led the campaign, lecturing throughout the state, and she was well received. For the next 15 years, the groundwork was laid for suffrage to become a reality in Colorado. The image on the right shows Carrie Chapman Catt. Elizabeth Piper Inslee and Ida Clark de Priest are two Colorado ladies that were very important to this movement as well. Inslee was an educator and an African-American suffragist, as well as a journalist, activist, and founder of local women's clubs. She moved to Denver in 1887 with her husband and children and joined Denver's relief efforts for the poor and homeless in the 1890s. Ida Clark de Priest grew up in Colorado. With Ensley, they founded the Colored Women's Republican Club of Colorado to teach African-American women to be educated voters. 
Elizabeth Piper Inslee fought for and won full suffrage for women of all races in Colorado in 1893. This was in a story entitled The African American Suffragist's History Forgot by Lynn Yeager in Vogue magazine in 2015. The image of is Elizabeth Piper Inslee, who lived from 1847 to 1919. Spreading the word was very important. The Colorado Antelope was a Denver Monthly women's rights newspaper founded by Carolyn Nichols Churchill in 1879. This was the first paper in Colorado to be edited and published by a woman. In 1892, it became the Queen Bee and it was published weekly. Come let us reason together, the motto of the newspaper, expressed Churchill's dedication to the interests of humanity, women's political equality, and individuality. By 1890, women were meeting in cities in Colorado to discuss the incendiary topics that she wrote about in the paper. The right shows a picture of Carolyn Churchill in her bonnet, and she lived from 1833 to 1926. Denver women formed professional, social, charity, and reform groups, such as the Colorado Women's Christian Temperance Union and the Ladies' Relief Society. They were networks for pushing reform issues to lead to the gradual education of citizens on the value of female franchise. In 1892, the Colorado People's Populist Party was founded with a motto of equal rights to all special privileges to none. Women delegates declared equality for all American citizens without regard to sex. The panic of 1893 led to a severe drop in silver prices and a major depression in Colorado. Dis disillusioned citizens decided, let the women vote. They can't do any worse than the men have. Colorado approves votes for women. Colorado was the first state in the Union to approve equal suffrage by popular referendum. November 7, 1893, women's suffrage was approved statewide by more than 6,000 votes, all male, by popular election. The final vote was 55% in favor and 45% opposed. In Jefferson County, 62% of the male voters approved the referendum. And the picture here is a picture of a polling place in Colorado on that election day. After the vote in Colorado in, 19, in 1894, Coloradoans elected three women to the state legislature. They were the first female legislators in the USA. They were Carrie Clyde Holly from Pueblo, Clara Cressingham, and Frances Clock, both from Arapahoe County, and Denver was part of Arapahoe County at that time. After achieving suffrage in 1893, at least 50% of the eligible women voted in the first elections. Female politicians pushed through important social legislation, including women's minimum wage law, child labor laws and abuse laws, pure food legislation, creation of the first juvenile courts, an eight-hour workday, and the prohibition of alcohol, which was approved statewide in 1916. The issue of prohibition actually was one of the reasons that women's suffrage had such a hard time getting passed. Colorado did lead the way. Soon, other western states started approving it. Washington, California, Oregon, Arizona, Kansas, the Alaska Territory, Nevada, and Montana all granted suffrage. Marches, demonstrations, and referendums supporting suffrage continued across the country. Anti-suffragist activities took place as well. The White House was picketed with nearly 500 women arrested. Suffragist prisoners were beaten and abused. There were many posters that came out during this time. One that I think is particularly appropriate is give mother the vote. Our food, our health, our play, our houses, our schools, our work are all regulated by men's votes. 
think it over and give mother the vote. Even though Colorado women could now vote, they continued to push for national suffrage rights. Baby Doe Tabor provided a place for the suffragists to meet in the Windsor Hotel, which she owned. The billboard on the right you can visit downtown, it says, Women of Colorado, you have the vote. Get it for women of the nation by voting against Woodrow Wilson. Their party opposes national women's suffrage. In 1918, the 19th Amendment passed the House, but lost in the Senate by only two votes. In 1918, President Wilson finally supported women's suffrage. In 1919, other states, including Michigan, Oklahoma, and South Dakota, granted suffrage. In 1919, the 19th Amendment passed the Senate. May 19, 1919, a joint resolution proposed amendment to the Constitution which extended the right of suffrage to women. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Congress shall have the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. And an image of that referendum, of that resolution is on the right. The 19th Amendment passed both houses of Congress. It then had to be ratified by three-fourths of the states. That would be 36 states. Illinois was the first state to ratify the amendment. That was in June. Colorado was the 22nd state in December. Tennessee was the 36th state to ratify, and that was August 8, 1920. Eight southern states had yet to ratify this amendment as of 1950, even though it was the law of the land. In 1984, Mississippi was the last of the 48 states to ratify the 19th Amendment. The picture on the right shows what was happening at the National Women's Party headquarters in Washington, D.C. after Tennessee ratified the 19th Amendment. They unfurled a banner from the balcony of their headquarters. 150 years of voting rights. The 15th Amendment passed in 1870. The 19th Amendment passed in 1920. But some state legislatures passed Jim Crow laws of racial segregation at the end of the 19th century. While some blacks were elected to local offices in those states, voting by blacks was suppressed in state and national elections. Poll taxes, literacy comprehension tests, residency and record keeping requirements were imposed in most of the former Confederate states. The Civil Rights Act in 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 ended legal seg segregation. The year 2020 marks the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment and the 150th of the 15th. Yet racism and voter suppression are still present in our society today. It is time to come together as one people, united and equal, regardless of race, sex, national origin, or political affiliation. Citizens over 18 years of age have the right to vote. This is an image of the state of Colorado, which depicts the colors of the National Women's Party suffrage flag. The colors represented purple, the glory of womanhood. White, the purity of home and politics. Gold, the crowns of victory for the achievement of the full right to vote for women. And the stars represent the states ratifying the 19th Amendment to the Constitution. Jefferson County connections include Dr. Rachel Staunton, who was a Pine resident from 1918 to around 1940. She homesteaded 680 acres while treating patients and running a sanitarium for those with tuberculosis. She was named to Jefferson County Historical Commission's Hall of Fame in 2018. A news article around 1918 stated, Dr. Rachel B. Staunton gained a number of converts to the cause of suffrage while visiting during the summer in West Virginia, where an anti-suffrage campaign was being held. At an informal gathering, she was asked to tell some of the advantages accruing from equal suffrage. 
she was able to relate a number of facts showing the practical benefits resulting from suffrage in Colorado. When asked if she herself were a suffragist, she replied that she considered herself a citizen of the United States. She is featured on the right. Margaret Tobin Brown, affectionately known as Molly, was a humanitarian, a philanthropist, a suffragist, preservationist, author, actress, singer, Titanic survivor, and heroine who fought for social justice, including juvenile justice, women's rights, minors' rights, and social equality. She attended national rallies on women's rights and was known as a suffragist. The Browns had a 320-acre farm in Jefferson County on South Wadsworth. They also enjoyed vacationing at Troutdale and Evergreen, so they did have Jefferson County connections. As a strong supporter of women's suffrage, she briefly ran for the U.S. Senate in 1914 on the National Women's Party ticket. Ella Deaver Weiss was the first woman to be elected to public office in Jefferson County. That was in 1894. Deaver was born in Central City in 1866 and moved to Golden as a young child where she attended Golden High School. She was an actress typesetter for the Colorado Transcript and a local editor for the Golden Globe. She was elected city treasurer on April 3rd, 1894, becoming the first woman in Jeffco to hold public office. This was just five months after women had run the right to vote in Colorado. In 1898, she married Lee Weiss, who was also an actor, worked for Coors, and was a city councilor. She died in 1952. In Jefferson County, attempts are made to provide equal voting rights for everybody who is entitled to vote. Jefferson County provides Spanish-speaking election judges, a sample ballot for Spanish, uh, in Spanish for voters, and speakers of other languages who are citizens are permitted to bring along a translator or to take the ballot home where a family member can translate for them. The Jefferson County Clerk and Recorder's Office will deliver or mail ballots to registered voters who have the right to vote who happen to be in custody, and parolees meeting requirements are registered to vote. Voter service and polling centers are located all over Jeffco to assist voters, and provisional ballots are also available. The Center for Colorado Women's History is located at the Byers Evans Museum. It focuses on the past, present, and future achievements of Colorado women and features scholarship, research, lectures, tours, and exhibits that expand the understanding and collective memory of the history of women in Colorado. Thank you so much for attending this important presentation on the history of women's suffrage and voting rights.